Hey, Hello, Christian. Been a while. I know. I was going to say, I don't recognize that name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been, uh, I've been really busy. So. This yeah, I think everybody's everybody's been real busy recently. It kind of sucks. Uh, hey, Jesse. Good morning. How are you, Doug? Good. How you doing? Excellent. Good. And David. Good morning. Hello. Simon, are you there? Hi. Yeah, I'm. Hello. Yo, Tommy. Yo. Good. <laughs> Hamid, are you there? I'm here. Excellent. Hello. Hello. So after last week's call, someone made some comment to me about how my microphone was really loud or there was a lot of static or something like that. Is everything okay right now or do I need to get a different headset? I think you sound great personally, but that's just me. Yeah, you sound great to me too. <laughs> okay, I just wanna double check, thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, who else joined? How are you there? Yep, hello. Hello. And Lucas. Hey. Hello. Hey there, Eric. Hello, Doug. Hi, Mark. Hey, Doug. Hi, Daniela. Daniela, you there? How about Timur? Here, hi, Doug. Hello. Daniela's hiding. Hi, Daniel. Hello. Hey. You guys are really nice and early. I like that. Hey, Lance. Hello. So, hey, Lance, I did ping Grant, um, but I don't think I actually did it until yesterday or maybe the day before. I can't remember for sure. To remind him that uh, he agreed to sort of talk to the the commit tagging stuff or whatever you guys call it. If for some reason he doesn't show up, do you think you could talk to that to give a quick overview of how it all works and what we're supposed to do? Or would you prefer to maybe wait till next week since I'm catching you off guard? I, I can do that. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. Okay, uh, Christoph. Hi. Hello. Daniela, are you there yet? Yes, Daniela here. There you go. All right. Thank you. Where are you? There you are. All right. Just a couple more minutes, then we'll get started. Howdy, John. Hello. So I'm getting the sense that you're trying to take the place of Clemens and be like the troublemaker in the group or something like that. Is that the way this works? <laughs> Is that why he's not showing up? We can't have two of you active at the same time? <laughs> I, I don't have to try to be a troublemaker. It just kind of happens normally. <laughs> I understand, okay. Uh, let's see, Manuel, are you there? Oh, Manuel? Hi. Hello, and Lou. Hi. Hello. All right, let's see. I think I got everybody so far. Do, 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 do.
Hello. Slinky. Howdy. All right, one more minute, we'll get started. Mm -hmm. All right, three after, let's do this thing. Uh, okay, we got 20 people. All right, um, AIs, Clemens, not here. Okay, community time. Anything from the community people wanna bring up that's not on the agenda? Mm, me? Anybody, uh, yeah. <laughs> very, yeah. Very quick, um, as you already know, I'm working on the implementation for the expression language and I'm going to extract from it um, a kind of TCK, so a JSON containing several cases and the expected results. So what I was wondering is uh, where should I place it? So is, should I place it like um, in the spec PR, uh, in the spec repo or, or where? The implementation itself, you mean? No, I'm talking about the, the TCK. So it will be a set of test cases in a defined format that each SDK or each implementation can consume and check if it's compliant or not. So I can show you an example of what I have in mind. Yeah, uh, let, me, let me go ahead and stop sharing. Uh, there you go, you should be able to share. No, now. no, 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 yeah, I oh. have to share. My uh, connection is uh, terrible. So, <laughs> okay, uh, that's fine, hold on a sec. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Okay, yeah, so open, on. open this link. Yeah, hold on. Now I lost all my windows. There we go. Oops. Do, do, yeah, do, if you go in tests. Uh, tests. Yeah. Anyone uh, in particular? Choose whatever version you want. Okay. Uh, choose the, uh, I think the last one, okay. And yeah, th these are test cases. Each JSON is a test case. It contains the schema and then it contains the test with the expected results. I wanna create something serial. So description of the test case, the expression, the input event, and then the test result. Hmm. Interesting. Looks yeah. kind of cool. Um, my initial reaction is this sounds very similar to like that conformance work that I know Scott's trying to get going. So I'm wondering whether this would be best suited for a brand new repo. That way you can do more than, or you could basically do whatever you wanted in there and, and, and have complete freedom. Does that make any sense or or not? I don't know. The, the thing is that we are already, I, I don't know honestly if it fits co uh, the conformance repo now. No, 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 not, not that repo. I'm gonna create another repo just for this. Uh, that could be fine too. Well, the, the thing is that we already have, you know, the grammar. I, I already PR the grammar in the spec repo. Maybe we should have a folder like in the spec repo which contains the spec and the test case, uh, the spec, the grammar and the test cases. Like, like a, bit of the, uh, a bit of reorganization of the repo because in the repo we also have like, uh, for each sub spec we have everything in the root of the repo. So like for example, the, for the subscription spec we have everything in the yeah. root of the repo. I mean, it might, maybe, Maybe it's time to to reorder a bit the repo. I don't know. Yeah, I know that that's been on my to-do list for a while. I actually was hoping to get to it this week, but I never did. Um, so, okay, yeah, tell you what, since since creating a whole new repo does have some overhead associated with it, let's do this. Let's let me go ahead and take the action item to create a PR to reorganize the repo, and then if, if it turns out a folder is is annoying or too big or whatever, then we can look at splitting out into a separate repo later. Yeah, for me, a folder should be enough. I mean. Okay. Okay. So, tell you what, let me do 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 do. Yeah, and I think it makes sense to have this in, uh, to fit inside the, the process that we use to merge things inside this repo. Yep. Because, you know, it's good that people take a look at the TCK and check if there's something that doesn't make sense. So, yep. I think it's better to keep it here. Okay. Yep. All right. Cool. Anything else in the community people want to bring up? Any other topics? All right. Uh, this week we do have the SDK call after this one. Um, oh, yes. Hey, Scott. What's up? Hey, so um, I did some work on the conformance tool this week. 
and you can now send uh, binary and structure events. And there's a uh, raw dump mode. So go check out the CLI. It's, it's, it, it mostly works. Give it a try. Cool. Excellent. Yes, agreed. Woot. Can we grab a link to that within the, uh, the meeting notes? Hopefully it's everyone else probably knows exactly where it is. Uh, hold on. <laughs> um, Scott, yeah, can you paste the link in there and I'll copy it into the meeting minutes? Be easier yep. for you to do that. No problem. Thank you. God, why is my screen? Okay. Uh, oh, I, oh, sorry. I, one more thing. I also released uh, the 2.4.0 of the Golang SDK. There are a couple breaking changes. Um, sort of. We we had to move some packages. They're technically not breaking. They are technically breaking. <laughs> okay. But we chose to not uh, bump it to three v three because they're they're very specific niche um, usages. So if you're upset, uh, I'm sorry. If we can talk about it and we can work around it. So reach out if you're, you know, pick pitchforks. Yep. Okay. And Mark just mentioned that there's a new PowerShell SDK out there. So thank you, Mark. Anything you want to say about that, Mark? No, it, it you know, it, it's, it's the initial uh, uh, input into initial commit into the repo. So uh, your mileage may vary, but uh, the team's going to be updating it and should be useful for people that like to use PowerShell. Yep. All right. Cool. Anything else for, for community time? Oh, thank you, Scott. Hold on a second. Oh, crap. I lost my window. Jeez. Conformance. There you go. There's a link to it. Cool. All right, moving forward. <clears throat> we do have an SDK call scheduled for this week. As of right now, I think there's nothing on the agenda. So please add an item if you want to discuss something. Otherwise, we'll cancel the call. Uh, interop. We didn't really have much of a call last week. Um, there has been a whole lot of progress. So let me just take this opportunity to nag people if you've promised that you, or if you said you were interested in participating. Um, we did say we we're gonna start beginning of April. Um, so please put up your endpoints in that document um, so people can start doing some testing. Let us know your status, which things may or may not work. So we know what we can hit and what we can't. Um, so just consider this being nagged appropriately. Anybody have any questions or comments on either of those things? All right, moving forward. Um, just a reminder, I did sign up for two 45 minute sessions. Uh, there's the times, please um, add your name here if you can join. Um, Remy did upload his video, so I think it's probably too late to make any changes to it, but if you're interested in seeing the video or the slides, I did include the links here, and he, so he's doing our cloud events session for us, okay. And uh, Timur, anything you want to mention from the workflow stuff? Uh, just more SDK stuff. Uh, we added a .NET SDK and a TypeScript SDK, and both were community contributions, so that was really cool. And other than that, yeah, we... I picked our um, sessions at KubeCon uh, very late, so we got those two in the, so we're, yeah, we're going to work on that and make sure we have all the content for that ready. Cool. All right, any does, questions? Oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, does, does the .NET uh, workflow SDK depend on the Cloud Events SDK, yeah, .NET SDK? Um, because if so, in fact, I was just just writing an issue for the PowerShell SDK saying, okay, you're depending on the, the latest GA of the .NET SDK, that makes sense, but it would be really good if everyone could be ready for when we're ready to do the 2.0, which will have breaking changes for .NET. Um, I hadn't been aware of so many other projects that were depending on the .NET Cloud Events SDK. Um, I would love to avoid breaking people or at least make it as short a break as possible. Um, so we should probably all get together. Yeah, definitely. I think right now that the workflow.net SDK does not depend on uh, the, the cloud events one, but 
that would be really nice actually to kind of combine them together on both the 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 java and the go and the dot net and, and and i will definitely try to join the sdk meetings for those discussions if that's okay with you guys cool all right um any any other questions for team around the workflow stuff okay in that case grant i noticed you joined thank you so grant do you want me to stop sharing or is there something you want me to click on how do you want to do this education session um yeah let's um maybe go to the spec repo okay well, that's um on github let me just go here quick it's easier to get there okay yeah so um one pr that we added in the master branch uh, is to add uh, a GitHub action that um, gives a green check mark if there's conventional commits. Right. So the goal of this is to, um, especially for folks that don't actively look at the spec um, every week and sort of you want an overview, um, it's to enforce or at least encourage folks to use conventional commits um, when they're writing their commits. And so uh, if we go maybe to like fix some typos, maybe the first PR there. Um, so, uh, and we go press the red X under the fix, or, or, or we look at that, yeah, under the details. Um, can see that the linter has ran and um, the commit message is like uh, not a conventional commit. It says the subject um, may not be empty and the type may not be empty. And so uh, the fix here would be to prefix with a type like a docs colon um, and fix it few typos. And so then um, when we get a lot of these commits in our spec, uh, folks can just look at, well, they sort of can ignore the um, the like doc changes that don't really affect anything. And then if there's a feature, uh, it'll have the feet um, prefix. And um, then, then you can look over uh, commits more easily that way. Okay, uh, Slinky has his hand up. Slinky, you have a question? Yeah, uh, to be honest, I, I don't, I, I don't understand why we need this, for the very simple reason that our Git flow is we do PRs, Doug merges them. <laughs> so, at the end of the day, is Doug that squashes the PR and types the actual. Uh, commit message commit title. So uh, I I think what we need is just to to have Doug uh, adjust any uh, the the automatic message generated by GitHub when squashing PRs and merging them. Um, yeah. So uh, that sounds fine. So uh, and that I mean the the overall goal is uh, when. A developer looks at the spec. Maybe I mean a lot of developers don't look at it every week, or even every month. But they'd still like to understand what are the top changes in the repo. So, so maybe the process is just um, if there are significant spec changes when Doug merges them, they're like under Doug uh, changes the commit message to like a feat or a fix or a docs, depending on what the changes. I love that. Does the, I love having work assigned to me, by the way. <laughs> so, but let me, so, okay, I, I have a couple questions, but let, let's go back to the queue. So, Jem, your hands up. Yeah, and, and I think my question was along probably the same lines as Slinky because I, I tripped over this. Um, it, what I found myself having to do is, you know, as I'm iterating on comments on the PRs, I'm having to do squashes every single time. 
And so I wasn't sure if, is it just the first commit in the chain that um, that this rule applies to or every single commit that goes through? Um, and, you know, is there an expectation that either I then, when we're ready, squash the whole thing and give it to um, Doug as a, as a single item or um, that maybe as Slinky said, that Doug does it at the time that he does the merge. Because I mean, I, I think it's it's uh, it's sort of affecting the way that I I tend to work iteratively. So if people put some comments in, I'll do a you know I'll do another tweak and a commit and a push to address those comments. So you sort of get this um, backlog of changes which eventually you want to squash. Whereas I think this seems to think that every commit I do could be the final commit. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so that go ahead, Grant. I guess that's a good point. Um, I think maybe we want to change the commit lid just to run uh, when on the master commit. It shouldn't affect uh, anybody just developing and trying to create a PR. Ah. Or, or, well, I guess, I mean, at least the goal is to. Um, the the only real change is the the squash commit at the end, um, and that's really where we care about if this passes or not. Cool. Okay. So so let me ask a question. Um, <clears throat> if because I I actually had a similar thought process to what I think Lance was saying in the chat, which is I thought we were doing this to auto generate, in other words. Uh, uh, like release notes kind of stuff, right? Or change log, yeah. whatever you want to call it, right? And we, we don't have that process defined in here. Or we, so I was, I was wondering, one, whether, Grant, you were planning on doing another PR to introduce that process, whether it's simply documenting it or whether it's adding additional tools or, or whatnot so that we can automate that process. But then also, do we want this this change log stuff, or I'm sorry, this this um, this conventional commits stuff, to apply to every single PR or just PRs that we think are significant enough to warrant mention in the release notes. Um, okay, so for the two questions, yes. Um, so one is, you know, first, uh, in order to get to be able to auto-generate a change log, we need to start using uh, conventional commits so that the change log has something to work with. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the eventual goal is, OK, uh, sort of like yeah, um, the uh, JavaScript SDK. Uh, if we start using conventional commits, then we can just auto-generate the change log um, and uh, yeah, a further PR would uh, introduce the auto-generated change log. OK. But are, is the assumption that if we need this on all PRs or just the ones that are significant? Um, I mean, all if, if we merge uh, and have all the changes, uh, all the PRs, to have a conventional commit that would make it easier for the tool. OK, because I'd, I'd like to get a sense from the group in terms of the process everybody wants to follow. Because if we want to, if we want to be consistent, then it seems like every PR should follow the same process. And while I don't necessarily mind doing extra work when I hit, that, when I hit the merge button, I, I can do that if people want, it also makes me a little nervous that I would be the one editing or typing the title that appears in the release notes when I kind of feel like it should be the author who at least does it themselves. And maybe I can, I could fix a wording, you know, a typo kind of thing, but I, I'm not sure I should be the one who comes up with it as opposed to the author themselves, because there's a good possibility to get it wrong. So it made, makes me a little nervous. So I just want to make sure we're clear on what a process we want to go as we go forward here, or what process we want to do as we go forward here. So Daniel, your hands up. Uh, yeah, a couple of uh, things. Uh, so first of all, there are, uh, 
there are tags for commits that are are meant to be like not this is this is not significant for the uh, change log. I think by uh, I think by convention chore is uh, is one of those that generally is just kind of ignored by the change log generation uh, tools. Um, uh, so if if we want to be consistent about having every commit be conventional, uh, we can just you know have a, a type uh, of chore or something that's uh, uh, that is used for uh, you know things that are not significant. Um, uh, to the other question about uh, whether we want uh, uh, so kind of having the commit author being the uh, or the the PR author uh, uh, driving the the, I guess the text of the uh, uh, of the line in, in the in the change log. Uh, I think that's the that was kind of the point of uh, having uh, a linter like this is to kind of uh, cause or for, force the uh, uh, the PR authors to participate in that process and to uh, get in the habit of uh, writing a conventional commit such that their uh, Understanding that this is, you know, uh, this is going to go into the change log, and so I should think about, you know, how this should appear, uh, and write the uh, uh, the commit message accordingly. Uh, so, is it? I th I think that was kind of the the point of it is is a tool to to kind of force us to think in those terms. Um, uh, so, uh, that said, if there are issues with like, well, I want to add more commits to my PR and they're not, uh, you know, uh, and, and now it's forcing me to, to change my workflow. Uh, I don't know if there, there might be ways to, uh, to, conf to, to configure the, uh, the linter in, in certain ways. I, th I think by default, it might assume that every, every commit uh, needs to be, uh, uh, needs to be conventional. Uh, but if we're going to squash, maybe there's a way to, uh, to, uh, to configure it to only check the first one because I think if you have more than one commit, then by default, Git uh, uses the uh, the the title of the PR rather than the commit messages itself as the default uh, or as a starting point for your your final squash commit name. So there might be ways to to configure it to uh, uh, to know that hey we're going to squash. Let's let's uh, optimize for that workflow. Okay, thank you. Uh, Slinky, you're, you're up next. Uh, uh, let, 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 let Scott talk because I think he has the same proposal that I, that I have. <laughs> okay, Scott. <laughs> hey, uh, so I, I, you know, based on every other project we work on, we use a convention where we, uh, we use a special tag block. And then uh, Kubernetes has this release notes tool that goes in looks at every commit that landed in that, um, that time frame, and then extracts that, that little block plus uh, potentially labels that were applied to the PR. And so it's, it has nothing to do with the commits and the commit messages in the squashing. It has everything to do with GitHub and the description. So that seems to work. Maybe we would like to do that because that's a little easier for the, um, both the, the the CI process that we use in GitHub and uh, poor Doug to not have to rewrite commit messages upon smashing, because this is so. Here's the text of what the commit conventional commits uses. So basically, it says it's Doug's job. You might want to comment on that. So, so, this, so correct me if I'm wrong here, Scott. I think then the 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 requirement of the developer or the the person who's submitting the PR is to make sure that they're they have the the proper release notes section in in their comment, right? Yeah, that's right. I could maybe next week I could show a little demo, and we have some uh, some wrapper GitHub action tools that help you kind of like extract a markdown file based on two hashes. Okay. What other people? Yeah. What other people think? And 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 I want to add that it's even simpler for you uh, for the users because uh, if we have a template for the issues, uh, we will enforce people to 
to write the release notes. So it's even better because we can't force the user to do that. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Uh, we can add a template that shows, you know, here's the section you fill in. You could even add a comment that doesn't get displayed in the PR description, kind of explaining what this thing is. And then uh, every time any PR gets opened, you you go through that little template and you can fill out the release notes. Okay, anybody else want to chime in there? Otherwise, I'm going to mention a proposal then. Okay. So Scott, you, you asked or you volunteered to, to share that process with us on next week's call. So why don't we go ahead and do that? Um, and, and, I, and I agree with you, Daniela. Yes, we'll, we'll modify the contributing doc if we even have one or create one if necessary. But yeah, whatever process we come up with, we'll make sure we, we document it someplace. I definitely agree with that. But so in the meantime though, it sounds to me like we're agreeing that not necessarily every single PR is gonna end up with a release notes type of thing. So technically for the PRs that we already agreed to merge that have this quote problem, if we don't think they're worthy enough to mention in the, in the release notes, I can just go ahead and merge those and not worry about the bot complaining. However, if there is one that needs, that we think should be in the release notes, what I wanna do is make sure people understand what things should look like. Um, so Grant is, I'm trying to figure out, is this a good example of what the commits message should look like? I mean. Is this so? When, when I do a commit, I just put this in the first line, and that's all that's needed to turn into a feature, to turn into a chore versus a feature or something like that. Yeah, exactly. So uh, you add a prefix of the type and optionally a scope. Um, and so, uh, as Daniel mentioned, chore ones will not be added to the change log, and so we can sort of ignore those. Um, but the significant ones like new features or fixes um, can have those prefixes. Okay, so it is the first line of the commit message, not the title of the PR, correct? Uh, yeah, for the, the current implementation, yeah. Okay, okay, cool. Okay, so let's, <clears throat> we don't wanna spend too much time on this. So why don't we go ahead and table this until next week and then Scott can talk about his proposal for a slightly different process. Does that sound fair? All right, cool. Yeah, sounds right. good. All right, right. cool. Yep. Thanks, Grant. Um, hold on. Do, 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 do. Here it is. Okay, so before we jump into the PRs, and I will merge this one now, Slinky, um, any other topics you want to bring up before we jump into the PRs? I got a nice long list today. All right. Let's go back to Slinky because it is the Slinky show today. Oops. Doo -doo -doo -doo. You're making me nervous. <laughs> All right. Back to this one. I believe a, a couple of people asked for this one to be held off a little bit. I think I might have been one of them. Um, I personally, I, I did do some thinking about this, but I haven't change my nervousness about it, but I also don't want to necessarily block it since we can always change it again later. So I'm okay with this going in um, for now, but what do other people think about this one? Anybody have any concerns, objections, questions? Uh, Daniela. Yeah, just uh, commenting that last time we, we had this discussion about how other, well, how database process this. And I did a few experiments on uh, uh, SQL Fido and basically Oracle, SQL Server and uh, the major ones, they throw an exception, but I feel like I think was my SQL, SQL uh, uh, and, and a few others, they basically returned no. So, and I, I know we did have this discussion of whether returning no was a valid option. So there are a few databases that do, do that. So could be a better alternative than uh, this one. Slinky, did you want to comment on that or not? To be honest, I strongly disagree with that thing now. It adds a whole more complicated set of problems that I'm trying to avoid as much as possible. So I'll be honest with you. And if we want to add null, it's not just about adding null for this specific problem. It's about adding null in the whole spec and language design. 
which is the same thing I, I, I explained for the error, um, um, for handling errors. Uh, this, this is a consequence of how uh, handling errors is defined in this language. And I'm very open to change it or modify it, but then it's, I, I think if we wanna do that, we need to bring up the discussion at a more higher level. So how do we handle errors in the language? Anybody else want to chime in? Okay. I guess my only question is, I, I, don't have an, I don't have an opinion on whether we should have nil or not, but I do agree with you that if we do choose to have it, that that's probably a very significant change, more than just this one operation. So my, my question is, and maybe you can refresh our memory, is if we don't want to support null or nil, would the next best thing not to be wouldn't the next best thing be to just make the return value of this zero, even though zero isn't technically null, it's closer than max and min int. That's my only question for you. Well, the reason why I choose my, uh, yeah, plus infinite and minus infinite is just because it seemed more reasonable to me, but we can uh, go back to zero and that's fine. At the end of the day, this still raises an error, and a, us a, a user will still eventually handle this error. So, anybody else want to chime in? Okay. I don't. I, like I said, I don't have a huge feeling on this. I just my gut is telling me zero might be more intuitive for people if we're going to return any number at all. Um. That's, that's one thing that keeps running through my mind. But I don't want it to be just one vote either way kind of thing. Um, okay, Daniela says, I prefer not to change it until we have a clear benefit of returning something different than zero. Eric seems a little more, leans towards zero as well. So Slinky, would you be okay if we held off a little on this until we get more feedback? Yeah, sure. Not, it's not a crucial part of the language, so. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's not, it's not really a big problem for me. So, okay, I appreciate that. Again, again, I opened this just because it seemed re more reasonable to me, but yeah. Okay. If we want there, to keep zero, it's fine. Okay. Is there any objection then to, to, to not doing this at this time? Okay. Um, let's move on to the next one then. Clarify in semantics. I think this was their last time too. Yeah, so, so this one, uh, we had the discussion of whether other... Uh, or the databases act on the typecasting when using the in. And I, I in the conversation I wrote uh, my findings, I tried with MySQL and Oracle SQL, I think. And yeah, it should be fine uh, this way. So this way is more like order sequence, let's say. But if I, uh, can you open the conversation? Because if I recall correctly on this one, Oracle SQL behaves differently from MySQL. Uh, this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because Oracle SQL doesn't have the Boolean literal true and false. And in MySQL, uh, the, type, the implicit type casting uh, is only valid for uh, binaries, but not for numbers. Here, I may, I may be doing some mistakes here, to be honest. Uh, so at the end of the day, they are not very the same uh, between Oracle SQL and MySQL. So I just chose to, to go with whatever seemed reasonable to me and, and for the user of MySQL, which is just, of course, always the types to the left argument type. So that's it. And that's, that's what I wrote in the spec, so. Okay, any questions or comments? Nothing? Okay, any objection then to approving? Done, easy, okay, cool. Um, John, do you want to refresh our memories on this one? Yeah, so uh, this is replacing a fairly brief couple of paragraphs with significantly more detail, um, attempting to squash out any ambiguity um, and also hopefully make life a little simpler and more reliable. Um, 
So it's encoding and decoding HTTP headers that are meant to represent uh, cloud event attributes. Um, and it's basically saying perform percent encoding on anything that's not ASCII or is a space or is percent for obvious reasons um, or is a double quote. And the reason for encoding spaces and double quotes is so that we don't then need to perform quoting as per RFC 7230. Um, but SDKs still must perform decoding via RFC 7230 for compatibility with previous versions of this spec. Um, so my hope is that it is compatible um, and it looks like the comments so far have been encouraging on that front. Uh, no one said, ah, it fails in this, this respect. Um, I've tweaked a couple of bits of wording. Um, have folks had chance to look at it as much as they're likely to? All feedback, welcome. Any comments? Speaking just for myself, I have not had a chance to review it yet, but I was kind of encouraged by some of the comments I saw go flying by. Um, that, that, as you said, it seemed like most people were not too concerned about breaking things, so that was nice. Right. And I'm definitely, while I would obviously like to get this in partly so that I can get the C sharp implementation in, although if if the noises are encouraging, I'm happy enough to merge the C sharp implementation in a sort of, this looks like it'll go in, but I definitely don't want to rush this. Let's get it right, right. rather than fast. Right. I'm, I'm inclined to ask for just one more week, but that put, but then put pressure on everybody, myself included to say, hey, <laughs> Unless you have concrete issues with this, we're going to take a vote next week, and 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 that means it's probably going to go in unless people have you know some concerns. That would be great from my perspective. Yeah. So anybody want to chime in at this moment? Okay. So I'll tell you what, let's do that because this is this is a significant change. So mm -hmm. hold on. Um, we'll vote next week. Whoops. Okay. Well, we're sort of in one of my topics. I note that the expand versioning suggestions is in too new to vote, uh, but it was from just over a week ago. So oh. we might want to. Uh, yes, I apologize. I, where are you, John, 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 John. Uh, Halfway through the too new to vote. So up a bit. Oh, geez. Um, there. Yeah, I apologize. I, I was really slacking on my job in terms of getting the agenda ready. Um, so you apologize. should see what we're like for the ECMA C-sharp standard. <laughs> <laughs> and normally I do this stuff no later than Tuesday and it just this week just got away from me. So I'm, hopefully after next week, my, my schedule will get a little bit more normal and I'll, I'll be able to get back to getting these things done timely. So I apologize. Actually, I suspect most of these are not too new. So, so forget this, I'll just remove that. Okay, uh, let's go back to Slinky then because we like hearing from Slinky. You want to, did we talk about this one? I don't think we did talk about this one last week. I think we didn't. Yeah, let me hide the comments. You could talk to it. Yeah, it's, um, so um, this PR is basically putting some constraints on how, how bad you can uh, uh, mess up your uh, engine, your expression language engine. So, um, I'm basically explaining that the overloading is allowed, but the, uh, but there is a limit on how you can overload. Uh, there is a sentence that is not completed because of the physical casting not functions with the same thing. Oh, okay, I need to fix that. <laughs> anyway, and, and so, so it puts some constraints on overloading and on variadic functions. So I'm just being more explicit on on how, how you can define custom functions. That's basically it. Or on how the spec can define functions and how engine can allow to define custom functions. So that's okay. it. Any questions? Nothing? Okay, I think this one's been out there for at least a week. Okay, any objection to approving then? 
Anybody want more time? All right, I'm not hearing either. Thank you, Slinky. Yeah, uh, let me let me remove line two or two before merging it. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Hold on. Uh, hold for one typo. Cool. Okay. Can do. And John, I think you might have briefly mentioned this one on a previous call. You want to refresh our memory? Yeah. Uh, so the the history of this is someone asked in the C sharp repo, how do we go about versioning cloud events? And this is a topic I'd been working on internally within Google uh, and obviously had strong opinions because I tend to, um, but it felt like something that deserved to be in the spec repo. So we created an issue here, um, discussed it about a month or so ago, and uh, I came up with this proposal, which I hope reflects the conversation from then. Now, given that it's a month ago, I suspect that almost everyone has forgotten what we actually said. Uh, but basically, this um, this suggests that the the type should be used as a sort of normative way of saying, um, do not expect these two to be backwardly compatible because they are different versions. And you, know, you can define a producer can um, perform their own use of semantic versioning or not, however they want to do that. Um, but one thing I would like to be checked within this is the part around the data schema attribute. So I have asserted without any particular evidence other than gut feeling and previous conversations, um, exactly this paragraph that you're looking at now around data schema attribute is expected to be informational. So I can see it being really useful for tools that let you um, inspect cloud events dynamically. Um, but my guess is that most code that is consuming a cloud event um, won't use the data schema at all it will expect things to be as they were defined when when the code was written or compatible with that um so please shout if i have completely misunderstood the point of data schema um i don't think i've had any comments on this one at all yet i could be wrong um again i'm not in this is even less of a hurry to to get merged um if folks could take some time to have a look and see whether I've written complete nonsense or not. That'd be great. All right, uh, cool. Yeah, that's it. Okay, any questions or in particular comments on that paragraph that's highlighted or where the cursor is? Just let me, let me be a little more forceful with that question because I that is something I've, I've often wondered myself because I tend to th agree with you, John. I tend to think that people tend to, um, for lack of a better phrase, sort of statically create the code that they're expecting to come in. And the idea of dynamically changing what you're going to get and analyzing the schema at runtime, it just, I, did, I, I don't know how often people actually do that. I always had a gut feel like you that they probably don't. It's a little more static than that. But I would love to know, does anybody on the call have the opposite opinion that there are lots of cases where no people actually do analyze the schema at runtime beyond a superficial schema checker thing um, do people actually use it for anything real? I, I can imagine um, some cloud events with particularly dynamic data where uh, the, the cloud event provider, producer, doesn't really specify the schema themselves. They just pass on data from something else. So you could have 10 different events, all with their own different data schema attribute, but that would be for a very particular kind of cloud event, I think. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to chime in with their experience? Okay. I, uh, I, I, I can speak up for a moment. I the I was going to speak up, and then you made that little quibble about uh, using the schema for validation purposes. And um, I've been writing Node for a while, and uh, because of the untypedness, I the, there's a whole lot of code that I don't have to write if I use the schema validator um, to basically say this this message that I'm receiving meets exactly the requirements that I have for that data. And uh, so uh, I don't think I don't see the uh, scheme as informational as part of my security apparatus and everything else. I don't know, a uh, bit of comment. Okay. So John, that sounds like maybe 
this paragraph here might be then a little too um, loose or something um, yep. because it doesn't take into account what Eric was just mentioning there, which is while they may not necessarily do anything like dynamically create objects on the fly because of it or anything like that, but they people may use it for schema validation at runtime. So it isn't strictly a development time thing. Yeah. Um, and I'm fine with it being used at execution time, although I would have expected um, if you're trying to validate that the data you've received is reasonable, uh, validating that against what the event itself says is reasonable feels like it doesn't buy you very much. It's sort of, do you say that you're okay? You do? Oh, that's all right then. Um, I'm being overly flippant, but uh, I would expect it to be more likely to validate against a schema that you have previously, that you knew about at, at build time. Um, but I could be really wrong. I would be. I would love to hear more in written comments that I can then try to inwardly digest, if possible. Eric, do you have any comments on that? I'd love to hear your your opinion on that. Oh, I, I agree. I, I, the the right, I'll be right back. Uh, I, I haven't accounted for dynamic schemas, um, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm. I, this is the first I've heard of it, so I definitely really need to actually read it before I make any more comments. Okay. We'll tell you what, why don't we, since since John, you said this was even less of a priority for you, why don't we hold off one more week and push for it to maybe get reviewed or voted on next week? That'd be fab. Thank you. Okay. Are we okay with that? Okay, so let's do that. Push for a vote next week. Please review. Cool. All right, Slinky, you're up yet again. Yeah, these ones are quite easy. So this is Concat WS. So it's concatenation, but using a delimiter. It's the same as ANSI SQL. So just out of curiosity, what does WS stand for? Oh, with don't, no. don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the one who chose such a bad name. <laughs> okay. Interesting. I see, yeah, that's what I was wondering too, Daniel. Wait, I thought maybe white space, but it seems weird that you can actually put in the delimiter so it's not just white space. Interesting. Okay. Anyway, any questions for Slinky on this one? Any objection to when, when did this go in? I, it's it's not it's not too new, is it? Yeah, eight days ago. Any objection then to approving? Ah, with separator. Thank you, Lou. That makes sense. Doy. <laughs> We missed the obvious there. All right, just to double check. Anybody disagree? Anybody have a uh, anybody have an issue with approving it? All right, there we go. Thank you, Slinky. Um, this one. Oop. Okay, you want to talk to this one? Yeah, this one is, I I basically simplified the definition of the custom functions. Yeah, semantically they are the very same. I just made the definition a bit simpler. Okay, let me just give everybody a sec just to quickly scan these, see if anything jumps mm -hmm. out at you. Seems fairly straightforward. Okay, anybody have any questions on this one? Uh, well, well, there is one semantic change. Uh, which is now you uh, is bool uh, returns true if you pass a boolean uh, as a value, and then um, int when you pass an in, an integer returns the identity, uh, bool when you pass a boolean returns the identity, string when you pass a string returns the identity. So it's that's this the that's the semantic change. Okay, any questions on that? You guys are still going on about the concat thing. Oh my gosh, <laughs> so funny. Okay, any objection then to approving this one? All right, done. All right, next, moving right along. Wait, when was, how old is this one? This one's eight days ago as well, it's good. All right, you yeah, want to so talk I to this one? I changed substring to look like SQL, simply. What was it before? Starting with the... 
Yeah. Oh, I, ending I, with, I, oh, I, length versus I, length versus index. Got it. Okay. Yeah, no, and then it's one indexed. Got it. Uh, yeah, uh, to be honest, the this, the, the string built-in functions were very drafted. So I, I scanned them, I scanned all of them and check if they they behave like other sequels. So cool. That's why that's why several PRs on this subject. Okay. Any questions on this one? Any objection to approving? Done. And back to our favorite XML. There was actually a small little Twitter thing about this over the or over the last week. People were mocking things written in XML, so I pointed them to this PR. So, Jim, we like, we like a good mocking. I mean, yes. I, I, um, I, you know, partly did this as an, a mental exercise, but there was an outstanding issue. Um, so it does, you know, it does address that. Um, take it or leave it i think that's what it is i mean this is it it shows what well, it shows a mechanism you know that you can uh, express cloud events as you know in xml format if if you want to do so yeah um nobody's mandating that you have to do it for all that xml isn't trendy it's extremely well supported in exactly. just about every language ever exactly um, I, I suspect it's actually far more useful than if we ended up with a YAML format or, or something like that. You know, cool kids stuff. Um, yeah, I was pleased to see this, uh, at which point I'll say I haven't reviewed it in depth, but I was pleased to see that it existed. Well, thanks, John. You're my new best friend. Well, you, you realize, of course, if we approve this, the next step has to be a SOAP binding, right? I mean, Jem, come on. No, 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 <laughs> no. Fine. Okay. Um, any questions off the bat? I mean, there's a little example, I think, at the end of this, which sort of, sort of will give you a, a glance into what the actual uh, event structure would look like. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's what, that's basically how you can think about it. Um, I, I, you know, I will admit I've not written any XML stuff for about 10 years, um, but I do remember that it was much more efficient to be attribute heavy and, you know, support a more streaming style. So that's, that's the model I went for. Um, and I added batch support at the same time. Yes, I noticed that. My only, I, I'll be honest, I have not had a chance to review this yet. So I'm probably going to ask for more time if you're okay with that. But my only thing that kind of, one thing that kind of jumps out at me is how can you do things like put ver instead of version? or spec version to, to completely well, align with the attribute. I, I, again, I think uh, this is a constant battle I have. I don't, you know, this needs to be humanly legible, but it's machine interpreted. Yeah, you know? so anywhere that I tend to try and be as efficient as, a, as I can, there's no need for verbosity there. That So I'm all about bytes on the wire, essentially, especially when we're talking about XML, which is naturally a little bit verbose anyway. So I can show you, you know, if you want to see unverbosed, you know, you should look at Swift messages or um, fix ML or something like that. Yeah, just the, the, uh, the anal retentive side of me likes consistency. That's the only reason I kind of was thinking about that. Um, so let me, let me pick on is, some is folks. There, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to ask, is there a reason why Ver is special for having its own XML yeah. element so, as opposed to Azure? So when you're stream, if you're stream processing, yeah, um, you need to get, you know, in my mind, you need to get the version as early as you can, so you can then make assertions about the stuff that follows it. That that was my only way of thinking. I mean, originally, th this was also a way of enforcing the version to be present. Um, I didn't, uh, I didn't go down the road that I did with the protobuf stuff of having all the required elements present because it, it just looked a little bit messy. Um, but having the uh, the version stuff there forces it. Yeah, you just- Oh, you, and it. having it as a sequence so yeah. that the has to be there. Whereas, yeah. so obviously you could say, well, the first atta has to be for the spec version, but that couldn't be enforced in the schema itself. Exactly, and, okay. and depending what sort of XML generation process you're using, you couldn't always 
control the order which those uh, elements are going to be emitted. Onto Could you not have just made it an attribute on the cloud or anything? I would have thought there would be a version attribute on here. Oh, there you go. You see, man after my own heart, attribute heavy. <laughs> yeah, I could do that. That would That's good feedback, Doug. Thanks. Yeah. I'll make that change. Okay. My yeah. only other feedback is at the uh, utterly trivial level of there appear to be some extraneous blank lines in the schema. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, okay, that's there for human readability. That's just me. That's my personal style, but we, okay. can, we can rip those out. If that's, all that's holding, if that's all that's holding it back, John, I'm more than happy to rip it out. <laughs> I will have a, a proper look next week. Thanks. Okay, I, we're, we're, gonna, we're, we're coming up on time, but Slinky, why don't you have the last word since your hand's up? No, no, I, I, oh, you said exactly what I wanted to say, that oh. you should have the version inside the cloud event as attribute. Yeah. And, okay. and to answer Slinky's comment, you would be surprised that I may already have uh, a Ooh. sort of rough support for it. Waiting for it. So, <laughs> so, so exciting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. You, you can tell it's been a slow couple of weeks, can't you? Yeah. Okay. So um, minor changes. Oops. Good golly. Okay. Look okay. to approve next week. Oh, my well, gosh. It could be the fastest PR I've ever got approved. There you go. Okay, with that, we're technically almost out of time. I think I got everybody for the attendee list except for Klaus. Are you still there? Yes, I'm there. Excellent. Could we do, could we, Doug, if we have a chance, could we look at the next one? Because it's really, really minor. Um, and oh. I think John was the guy who prompted me into it. Um, sure, go for it. Here, let me hide the comments. Yeah. I, I had one so, comment in there. So just for reference for people, this is, um, for some reason, uh, I had a mental brain fart and I didn't add um, batch support when we originally defined the protobuf format. So uh, this adds that. Um, it's really simple construct, just a, a, a repeating set of events. Okay. John, does everything look okay to you? It does indeed. This one I have actually reviewed, and I think even if I'm able to give approval, I think I possibly probably did. Um, yeah, basically, okay. Gemini had the same thought at roughly the same time, and uh, he was good enough to implement it instead of me doing so. Okay. Uh, so I think, the, Doug, you'd made that comment. Um, I can change that language. I mean, as I said, I mean, I, I was trying not to just blindly copy the language from the JSON format, but it, that is very similar language okay yeah if, if we're in if we're consistently awkward then that's fine <clears throat> that would not hold up the pr then I'll, if it bothers me that much i'll open up a separate pr and try to address both specs at the same time right that would be a good i think a, a good a good move okay because it okay. is a bit it's a bit of a struggle to read but i am, but you understand the thrust of it yeah. yeah um are you hoping to vote right now uh if we if people are willing to do so um or you know obviously just give a thumbs up on the pr if anyone has uh has okay. a desire. well let me ask the question is there anybody who wants more time to review this any objection to approving even if you you know well i already asked if you want more time Okay, I'm not hearing any objection. I, I'm especially since we have had somebody who, who's who knows this stuff like John. He he he's okay with it. I'm, I see no reason to wait. It's been seven days, so one last chance. Any objection? Good gosh. Okay, cool. In that case, we are done. Thank you all. And last chance. Did I miss anybody for the attendee list? All right, cool. In that case, um, if you're not, if you're a non-SDK person, you are free to leave. Um, anybody have any topics for the SDK call? Otherwise, we will not have an SDK call. All right, not hearing anything. We're then completely done for the day. Cool. Thank you all. We'll talk again next week. Good call. Thanks, Thanks folks. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.